Okay, hi everyone. This is gonna be a video walkthrough for question two on exam prep week 10. Okay, so the first question states, if a graph has n vertices and n minus one edges, it must be a tree. So in order to answer this, we should first know what a tree is. Let's recall a tree is a special graph that has three properties. It is connected, it has Actually, we're gonna say two properties. It's connected and acyclic, okay? There's like a third somewhat property that I'll explain later. So if we have any graph, this is a tree, right? This is also a tree, but when we add in this red edge, we see it's not a tree anymore because it's not acyclic. And if we get rid of these two edges, we see it's not a tree because it's not connected, okay? So a tree is connected and acyclic, and it says right here that if a graph with n vertices has n minus one edges, it must be a tree. Well, let's see. If a graph has n minus one edges, it may look like this, in which case it's not necessarily a tree, right? Because it's not fully connected. In order to make this claim true, if a graph has n minus one edges and it is connected, then it must be a tree. So, Let's see why this claim makes it true. If a graph is fully connected, like it's fully connected here, we see that it must have exactly n minus one edges, right? If it doesn't have any cycles, because the first new edge we introduce will create a cycle, okay? So another way of thinking about a tree, another definition that I mentioned in the beginning is that it has n minus one edges, where n is the number of vertices, okay? so. A quick recap, this first question is false. The reason it's false is because we need to add in this claim that it must be connected for us to know for a fact that this graph is a tree, okay? And the quick counter example is this graph has n minus one edges, but is not a tree, okay? So the next question states, if a graph, okay, it says, the adjacency matrix representation is typically better than the adjacency list representation when the graph is very connected. So to answer this, we should first know what these two representations are, okay? So let's quickly describe those using a quick graph. Okay, so let's say we have this graph. I wanna make my life easier, there we go. Okay, there's two ways we could represent this graph in code. The first way is called an adjacency. It's an adjacency matrix. Okay, so now adjacency matrix works is it'll be a n by n matrix where n is the number of vertices. Okay. And the left hand side or the rows will be the two or actually, no, 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 my bad, my bad. These are from, okay? So it's the vertices where the edge starts at. And then over here, we'll put two. It's where the edge finishes, okay? So looking at this graph, we see there's an edge from A to B. So what we'll do is in this corresponding entry from A to B, we'll put a one, okay? And we can just quickly fill that in for C and B as well. So this is how we represent this graph in an adjacency matrix, okay? So let's see what happens if we choose a different way of representing this graph using something called an adjacency list. Okay, so what happens here is for A, B, and C, what we're gonna do is we're going to have a corresponding list, okay? So the list for A, B, and C, or for A, is going to be all of the things that are neighbors of A, right? All of the things that A points to. So in this case, the only member of A's list is B, B's list has nobody, and C's list also has B, okay? So when we actually implement this in code, we won't have like these extra elements here. I just did that for the sake of this example. Okay, perfect. So this is how like it would look in code. We wouldn't have like unneeded size of the list. Okay, perfect. So which one is better? <laughs> well, there's no like concrete answer, but one advan like one way of representing 
has benefits over the other. Okay, so an adjacency list, list an adjacency list representation is typically better if we're trying to find all of the neighbors of A. Okay, if we're trying to find all the neighbors of A in an adjacency list, we only need to look at the number of neighbors they actually are. An adjacency matrix, at worst case, we iterate through all of the vertices in this graph. Okay, so adjacency list benefit looking at neighbors is quicker. Another benefit is it takes up less space in memory because you see right here that we only have two lists. Over here, we have an n by n matrix. So two quick benefits are neighbors and space. Okay, so an adjacency matrix is better because in order to know if there's an edge between A and B, it's a constant time operation because we just go to that spot in the matrix and check if there's a one there. For an adjacency list, in order to see if there's an edge between A and B, what we'd have to do is iterate through all of these vertices, right? And if the list is long, it's going to take us a lot of time. So we can see that if the graph is very connected, what that means is all of these lists right here are going to be really long. And because of that, this benefit of the like quick looking up neighbors, we kind of lose it, right? Because if A's list of potential neighbors is really long, then we can see that it isn't much different of just looking through all the vertices in the graph, right? So when the list of vertices is long, the advantage of like looking through a small list of neighbors is lost for an adjacency list. Okay. And the space thing is also lost because if there's a ton of neighbors, now like this series of lists is really, really big. So we can kind of see here that when the graph is really connected, the adjacency list loses some of the benefits it used to hold over an adjacency matrix. And because of that, we could say that this is true, that the adjacency matrix representation is typically better when the graphs are reconnected. On the flip side, it's important to note that the adjacency list representation is typically better when the graph isn't that connected, right? OK, phew, that one was a lot. Let's quickly get rid of those. Okay, I'm going to make this a bit more aesthetic to look at. Okay, nice. So the next question asks, every edge is looked at exactly twice in every iteration of DFS on a connected undirected graph. Okay, so let's create a connected undirected graph. Okay, so how many times do we look at this green edge? Well, when we're at B, we look at it. When we're at D, we look at it. So. How many times are we at B? Well, each DFS iteration visits, visits each vertex exactly once. When we're at D, we'll be there exactly once. When we're at B, we'll be there once, right? So we can see that each edge is looked at exactly twice since we look at it when we're at B and we look at it when we're at D, right? So true, we look at each edge when we are at u and v. So we'll say when we look at each edge between u and v, when we're at u and when we're at v. Nice. So in BFS, let d of v be the minimum number of edges between a vertex v and the start vertex. For any two vertices in the fringe, this absolute value is less than two. So Let's see what that's saying. If we have some graph, B, D, C, D. Okay, if we have some graph, and actually let's just, let's do an arbitrary graph. Let's say we have some fringe. Okay, yeah, let's say we have a fringe. I'll get to this example later. All right, and in the fringe we have two vertices. Let's just call them X and Y. What the question is stating is that the distance from x to a minus the distance from y to a is within two, right? So intuitively, what it's trying to say is that x and y are of similar distance to a, which makes sense because that's what BFS ensures, right? What BFS is trying to say is that we look at all of the people that are one away, then two away, then three away, then four away. That's kind of how BFS works. So we see here that the claim is 
the distance between u and v in the fringe is always less than two. Okay, so in order to prove this, I'm gonna use a proof tactic called proof by contradiction. So how this works is I'm gonna say, suppose this wasn't the case, okay? Suppose we had u and v in the fringe such that the distance, such that h of, actually, no, 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 my bad, it's d, such that d of u minus d of v is equal to two, okay? So we're entertaining this possibility, right? If this possibility, like if there exists this possibility, then we'll say like, oh, like amazing, we're done, right? So if this possibility can't occur, then we can prove that this is true, right? So that's the idea here, okay? So suppose that the distance from u to a minus distance from v to a was equal to two. Let's look at an example of such in this graph. Okay, so look at C and G. Notice that D of C minus D of G is equal to two minus four, right? I should, I missed out some values, which is equal to two. So this is a possible like counter, like example that would make this thing hold, okay? So looking at this example, I'm gonna prove that this could never possibly occur. The reason it can't occur is that in order for G to even be on the fringe, it means that we get went to F, right? So notice that for G to be on the fringe, this implies we went or we popped F out of the fringe before C, okay? So for G to be on the fringe with C, it means that we popped F out of the fringe before we popped C out of the fringe, right? So why can't that be the case? Well, BFS ensures that we look at vertices in terms of increasing distance from A, right? Since f is three away and c is two away, there's no possible way that we could have looked at f before we looked at c, right? Because that's not how BFS works. BFS has the invariant that we look at vertices in increasing order from their distance to a. So we couldn't have looked at f before we looked at c because c is closer to a and BFS wouldn't have allowed for that. So we can see here that it's not possible for the distance from u to a minus the distance from v to a is equal to two, right? And if it's not possible to be equal to two, we know that it must be less than two, right? So we can say that this is true, right? And then C counter example slash proof. Okay, so if you guys are actually like on an exam, you guys should write down the justification that I described, described vocally. But for the sake of finishing this, I'm going to move on.